march of time. counties in Pennsylvania lie billions of tons of unmined coal. Almost all the anthracite in the United States today. For nearly 10 years, most of the mines have been shut down. Their miners jobless. Yet today, the hard coal towns of Pennsylvania are not bankrupt. Stores stay open late. Cars crowd the streets. The mining people are decently dressed. Long before federal and state governments began handing out billions of dollars for relief, these people found a way to help themselves. What keeps them self-supporting is a continuous procession of motor trucks, rumbling day and night out of the mountains. In these trucks are thousands of tons of bootleg coal, stolen from the shutdown mines. When the mines began closing down 10 years ago, the miners lived on their savings hope for better times. As the abandoned collieries crumbled into ruins, the miners faced starvation. The companies let them pick over the waste heaps for coal to feed their home fires, to warm their children, and their churches to which they could no longer give money. Then the jobless miners started trading coal for life's necessities. When depression deepened, the miners went a step further. Well, I got a new job. Yeah? yeah. Yep. Right for myself. Three bucks a day. On their abandoned properties, companies posted trespass warnings. But the miners pushed past them, dug out coal from the hillsides, which they felt owed them a living. At first, they dug furtively. At night, they sold their stolen coal to local merchants who realized that this illegal coal business might keep families alive. Today, the business of stealing coal has become a community enterprise. 25,000 men organized in crews of four to a dozen, using crude but effective homemade machinery, bring the coal to the surface. Other workers, young and old, prepare it for market, for sale in New York, Baltimore, Washington, as far north as Boston, for two or three dollars less per ton than legally mined coal. Though the industry now grosses $50 million a year, the bootleggers firmly believe they are only taking what belongs to them. Time and again, to protect their properties, the mine owners order company police to drive the bootleggers from their workings. He says, how about it, fellas? No, we... All right, then. I warn you. The company means business this time. So do we. When the police fail and local courts refuse to interfere, the company sends men with dynamite to blast the bootleg holes. Defiant answer, the bootleggers sink their shafts deeper into the earth, into virgin seams of rich, gleaming anthracite, worth millions to the mine owners. When court action seriously threatens their business, the bootleg miners organize to fight it. Men, we are going to fight this injunction to a finish. We are organized now. Our energy is as good as theirs. And so is our cause. 
Our grandfathers worked these hills, and so will we. If they try to put us off, we'll show them. What's going to be the signal, Chief? Or a blast of that fury whistle. When you hear it, come and fight for your cause. Asked to mediate, journalist Joe Agor brings about an agreement between the bootleggers and the owners of one mine company. The bootleg chief agrees that his men will leave their holes when the owners promise to give them honest jobs. But this agreement affects only 350 men and two shafts. As the trucks of the 25,000 remaining bootleggers continue to rumble out of the hills, Pennsylvania waits to see if the Shemokin settlement will lead the way out of the most menacing industrial crisis in the United States today.